okay tonight? Praise God. You know, I don't know what y'all thought about last week. I mean, if y'all uh, were, um, if y'all were, um, you know, distracted or you didn't get out of it what you desired to get out of it. I hope that doesn't do to you again. But there was a, a specific purpose in all of that. And uh, anyway, let's just move forward. So again, the title of this little mini series is Ladder Reigns, and, and we're going to talk about uh, the, the implication of that. And if you'll remember last week, one of the big things that I talked about was this Wesleyan holiness movement, okay? And, and we talked about a couple of the songs that came out of this movement. One of the songs was uh, written by Charles Wesley. That was John Wesley's brother, if you'll remember. The, the song was, was called, the title of it was, And Can It Be? And I gave you all the lyrics to it so that you could read it. And if you'll remember, like, some of the words in the beginning phrases of the song, and I'm not, I mean, I'll try to sing it, but I'm not expecting you to enjoy it. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain. It was for me. I think this is how the words go. It was for me to he held until death pursue. What? What did you just say, Charles? It was for me he held to death Pursue. He pursued death for me. My Jesus, the bread of heaven that was sent to earth, pursued death for me. He had a, he, you know what he told the Samaritan woman? He said, it is my meat to do my father's will. What was he talking about? Meat. King James Version, food. It is my nutrition to do my father's will. What you and I need tonight is a, re a clear revelation of the love of Jesus. To understand that he loved us while we were yet sinners. To understand that every last one of us in this room is in the same boat. Born of Adam, born in sin, but hallelujah, Jesus came to die on the cross for our sin. And then in that other song, it talked about what it was, uh, send the fire again. Send the fire again. And he said, uh, we, we need, uh, it talked about your blood-bought gift. Do you remember the words to that? Your, send your blood-bought gift. What is he trying to say? He's trying to say, Jesus already purchased the gift of the Holy Spirit for us. And what they were doing was they were crying out that God would send the fire again in the 1700s and 1800s. He said, we need another Pentecost. We need, do you know in your own life that you can become dry? Spiritually speaking, you can become dry. You're like, well, I've never faced dryness, brother. Well, hang on, buddy, because like you, well, number one, you might be dry right now and don't realize it. Uh oh. But number two, if you hang around long enough, you're likely to get dry. But that should be the cry of all of our hearts, the cry of the church, the cry of the people of God. Send the fire again, Lord. We need another Pentecost. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, Amen, so that we could do the work of the Lord. And and like this was, you remember that was the title of the message. And I'm pretty sure that I probably probably wore y'all down with all them words. I wanted to read the whole thing on purpose. I, not that I expected all of y'all to get up and come wailing at the altar on your face, even though that's what would happen when John Wesley would read those messages. Crowds and crowds of people would fall prostrate on the ground and weep and cry because the Holy Spirit would deal with their hearts. But one thing that I did want you to notice about the music and about the message did anybody notice anything that was common between the music and the message that we talked about? Yes, sir. Robert? It preached and it was full of scripture. Hallelujah. See, that's what I wanted y'all to see. So it was successful. Now, whether or not anybody enjoyed it while it went down is another story. But it was successful. It preached and it was full of scripture. Read another, 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 
God has given me is a hunger and a thirst for his word. And a hunger and a thirst to understand how things have gone before. I've made fun before and I've said, look, my favorite character in cars is Toe Mater. Because Toe Mater drives backwards. And he said, I'm the best backwards driver in the whole world. And I don't need to know where I'm going because I know where I've been. See, there's some truth to history, my friend. God has been moving in the midst of human history. And whenever we don't view history from the standpoint of God's history, we get all skewed and disorganized and confused. But when we begin to view God's history or God's movement in the midst of history, it all begins to take shape and it all begins to make sense in the world that we live in. What I need you to understand is, is this, is that one of the reasons I wanted to move backwards to go forward is I wanted to show you the way that God has moved in the midst of really the last 230 years. I could have really done a series on the, the spirit of prophecy and we could have started back at the camp with, with really before that probably, but it sticks out tonight at that time I preached on El Dad and Me Dad, the, the dad brothers. I guess they were brothers. I don't know. Whenever, whenever Mo, the, Joshua comes running into the camp and he tells Moses, Moses, you got to stop them. El Dad and Me Dad, they do prophesy in the camp. And Moses said, for me, you envy and you desire for them to stop? I would that all God's people would be filled with the Spirit of God and that they would all prophesy. And that's what Pentecost is all about, about the people of God being filled with the Spirit of God, that we could all speak forth the truth of God. And that's what I wanted you to see because, look, the Wesleyan holiness movement, while we, many of you may not have ever even heard of John Wesley, okay, but that's not really the point. The point that I'm trying to make to you is this, that they were hungry for a move of God, they were hungry for the Spirit of God, they were hungry for the Word of God, and that that is a common theme that's going to take place whenever God's going to move. God wants his word on, on the forefront and God dis, the, and the Holy Spirit wants to move through the word of God and God wants to do a work in people's hearts and lives. Now, I'm going on to the next phase. This gentleman here is named Charles Parham, okay? Charles Parham was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he had a Bible college. This is a quote that Par Parham made, and I'll read it to you. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is given to illuminate his word, to open the scriptures, and to place the spiritual man in direct communication with the mind of God. I thought that was pretty good, but look, this is a picture. It's hard to see. It looks like a big old castle, but that's a picture of his Bible college that was in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, and, and so uh, he had multiple scriptures students that were there, and one weekend he was going on a preaching trip, okay? And this is what he told him. He said, listen to his students, I've been studying in the book of Acts, and I firmly believe that there's a second work of grace that takes place after salvation. And he said, look, and it's a power from the Holy Spirit. And he said, look, we need it. We need whatever the disciples had, we need it. So I'm asking y'all to do a little study while I'm gone. And I want y'all to try to find, if you can find a common factor where, where the second work of grace, where this baptism of the Holy Spirit that they talk about. And so this is what happened. This lady right here, Agnes Osmond, she was one of the students. While Parham was away, she diligently began to study the scriptures and she noticed that people were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues. She got filled with the Holy Ghost. She got filled with the Holy Ghost. She began to speak in other tongues. You see, it's documented in this book right here, written by Assemblies of God. Now, I'm, I don't know what you think about the assemblies of God, and I don't really, not really that worried about what you think about the assemblies of God right now, because I'll probably think the same thing about the assemblies of God that you think about the assemblies of God, because as soon as men start putting their dirty little hands in what God is doing, but you give it enough time, and everything's going to be corrupted, okay? And so we already know that, but nevertheless, look, they, they chronicled the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit in what we call the latter day reigns. If you'll remember what I told you last week, is Pentecost was a feast long before it was a day. Now, the beauty of this is this. God is repeatedly speaking to people in so many ways. How, how do you even describe this? Now, you got to just slow down a second. You got to think about this. 2,000 years before God would ever send Jesus to this earth, he called a people out of Egypt. And when he called them out of Egypt, he told them after the Passover, every year, you're going to keep this, these feasts in remembrance of me. 
And in that feast, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits was a, a harvest feast called Pentecost. And I talked to y'all about that. I talked to y'all about the fact that the former rains and the latter rains were what prepared the crops for the harvest. And what I'm trying to say to you is this is that when you view the day of Pentecost as the former rain to prepare the hearts of people to receive the seed of the gospel, and when you see the latter rains, which is what we're talking about right now, we're about to get into it right here, the Azusa Street Revival is what Pentecostal people in modern times are calling the latter day rains, that now what we begin to understand is this. Could it very well be that the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit since the time that Jesus ascended and the Holy Spirit descended and they received the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the upper room, that that was the beginning of the preparation of the soil for the seed of the gospel to be planted in people's hearts and that now nearing the end, a couple of hundred years ago, a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place. This woman right here is the first woman that is documented that spoke in other tongues that listen there were sporadic happenings but what you got to understand is is that people weren't speaking in tongues for over the last 300 years even during the wesleyan holiness movement it wasn't happening i'm trying to teach you something and 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 help you to understand where you are now in the midst of history in the midst of church history this was a big deal but look it spread like wildfire it spread over the earth Pentecost spread all over the earth again. People were getting filled with the Spirit, and this happened about 1901. Now, latter-day reign. This gentleman on the left is Charles Parham. The other gentleman is William J. Seymour. William Seymour, the African-American gentleman, is the guy that was from Centerville, Louisiana. It was through his ministry that the Azusa Street Revival began. Azusa Street. William J. Seymour, sitting under the teachings of Charles Parham in Houston, Texas, heard him talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He did not receive the infilling at that point in time. A lady asked him to go to Los Angeles and to teach, the, to, to preach. He went in the morning service. It was called a Holiness Nazarene Church. That's a denomination that still exists, but we don't hear much about it. It was birthed out of the holiness movement. So the Holiness Nazarene denomination were people that just wanted to understand the holiness of God and wanted to live for God and to be holy. Does that sound like something that God's people should want to do is to live a holy life? So he preached on this baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in other tongues, even though he himself had not received it yet. When he came back that night for the night service, there were uh, ch chains and a lock on the door of the church. Okay, but then a lady opened up her house. This is called the Bonnie Bray House. This is where Azusa Street first started. This is not Azusa Street, but this is where it first started. You can't see it much, but it's just a picture. It's a modern day picture of the house where the revival moved to. They say that the crowds were so thick in this little area that one day they broke the porch on this house. So from there they bought this old livery stable. It was like an old place where you would shoe horses and things of that nature. And so they began to have services here. The, the streets were packed. People were coming from all over the place. This is some of the things that were said. I think that I put it in here. This is some of the things that were said in 1906 in the newspapers. Fanaticism. In the newspapers, this is what they were putting. Fanaticism. Talking in gibberish. Large crowds. Look, their black preacher keeps his head in a box and cries. This is the things that they were reporting in the newspaper. Okay, because the naysayers on the outside didn't know what to do with it. The crowds were thrown, like I'm talking about huge crowds of people, people getting filled with the Holy Ghost, okay? And in the midst of all of that, God moving upon the earth and spreading like wildfire to cause people's hearts to have a desire to move closer to the Lord, amen? All right, so I wanted to just go back to the letter to the Corinthian church. Because, look, this is where we learn about the gifts of the Spirit. But look, I want, I've said this before, but I want to say it again. And why am I even, why am I even, bless you, bless you. Why am I even saying these things? Because I firmly believe 
God wants to do a move of his spirit in the last days that we are living in. What that exactly looks like, I don't know. Guess what? I don't need to know. What I do need to know is that God wants to pour out his spirit. God wants souls saved, and he's going to do it. Listen, if he's going to harvest souls off this earth, I can promise you, if he sent the former and the latter rains, and the latter rains' purpose was to make the crop full before the harvest sickle was thrown into the harvest. Guess what? Before he pulls souls out of here. Now, listen, we might have differing opinions on when the rapture is going to take place, and that's okay. I'm fine with that. If y'all are good with me, I'm good with you, and we just all be a big old happy family. But let me just say this. If the pre-tribulation, if it's a pre-tribulation rapture, then we should be expecting a revival any minute. But is there the possibility, and look, I remember Sabrina making this comment to me on two different occasions. I don't know if it was a word of knowledge or not. She may not even remember. She said, you know, Matt, sometimes maybe it seems like people don't really want to hear everything that you have to say, but the Lord's been giving you some answers, and there's the possibility that one day, there's the possibility that one day there's going to be a time when people need answers. There's going to be a time whenever things are not very comfortable anymore. And whenever the possibility of things not being comfortable anymore, they're going to be seeking to have answers. And so what I'm trying to say is, and I was sharing this with Aaron, because I do believe God is going to move on the earth before he harvests this earth. But it might not look like what we're expecting. It might be in the midst of tribulous times. You understand what I'm saying? In the times of your life that you have prayed the hardest and the most and you have persevered before the Lord, was it when everything was hunky-dory? Was it when you had all kind of money in your pocket and everything was going good? Or was it when you were in the midst of hard times, when you were in the midst of trouble? When I, what, what did God say to Moses? I have heard the cry of my people. It wasn't when Whenever they were free and living in the promised land, it was when they were Egyptian slaves. God is waiting for his people to cry out. Now, we don't have to wait till the till bad times show up, my friend. We can start praying right now. And as a matter of fact, if we want to see God move in our midst, that's what it's going to take. We're going to have to be willing to take time, whether we come together in the church, whether we show up early before service, whether we're praying at home. I don't know when you're going to do it. I don't know when I'm going to do it. But but if we want God to move and send souls and to see disciples made, we're going to have to spend some time in prayer. Because listen, the Lord is waiting to hear our cry. And he's waiting to hear our heart beating like his heart beats. And his heart beats for souls. Amen. One of the things I don't want to make this point is this. Is that just because the church is operating in the gifts doesn't mean it's operating in the fruit. Doesn't mean it has fruit. This is what the Apostle Paul said in the letter to the Corinthians, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. You know what he's saying? You got all kind of utterance gifts. You got all kind of knowledge gifts. He's talking about the gifts right here. He's like, and he goes on to say this. He says, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You got all the gifts. <laughs> Corinth, you got all the gifts, right? He says, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So do you see that? I need you to see that. I want you to acknowledge it, that the, that the Corinthian church was full of the gifts of the Spirit. There were words of knowledge, words of wisdom. There were uh, words in tongues. There was interpretation of tongues. But the apostle Paul says, even though they were full of gifts, they were carnal. See, Sometimes people get prideful. But anyway, that's another, that's another thing. He says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto or up to this point you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Just like Corinth received correction from Paul, Azusa Street received correction from a man named Frank Bartleman. Can I read you to uh, what is chronicled in this book, Anointed to Serve, documented by Pentecostal leaders in the church? This is what uh, Frank Bartleman says right here. It says this, Frank Bartleman's concern over propriety and scriptural balance provided the needed correctives to keep the vigorous new revival in the proper channels. Okay? He writes, 
In the beginning of the Pentecostal work, I became very much exercised in the spirit that Jesus should not be slighted. Lost in the temple by the exaltation of the Holy Ghost and of the gifts of the Spirit. There seemed great danger of losing sight of the fact that Jesus was all and in all. I endeavored to keep him as the central theme and figure before the people. Jesus should be the center of our preaching. All comes through and in him. The Holy Ghost is given to show the things of Christ. The work of Calvary, the atonement, must be the center for our consideration. The Holy Ghost never draws our attention from Christ to himself, but rather reveals Christ in a fuller way. We are in the same danger today. There is nothing deeper nor higher than to know Christ. Everything is given of God to that end. The one spirit is given to that end. Christ, our salvation and our all. That we might know the lengths and the breadths and the heights and the depths of the love of Christ. Having a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It was to know him for which Paul strove. I was led to suddenly present Jesus one night to the congregation at 8th and Maple. That was the Bonnie Bray house. They had been forgetting him in their exaltation of the Holy Ghost and the gifts. Now I introduced Christ for their consideration. They were taken completely by surprise and convicted in a moment. God made me do it. Then they saw their mistake and danger. I was preaching Christ one night at this time, setting him before them in his proper place when the Spirit so witnessed of his pleasure that I was overpowered by the presence, falling helpless to the floor under a mighty revelation of Jesus to my soul. I fell like John on the, I fell like John on the Isle of Patmos at his feet. I wrote a track at this time, of which the following are extracts. We may not even hold a doctrine or seek an experience except in Christ. Many are willing to seek power from every battery they can lay their hands on in order to perform miracles, draw the attention and adoration of the people to themselves, thus robbing Christ of his glory and making a fair showing in the flesh. The greatest religions, religious need of our day would seem to be that of true followers of the meek and lowly Jesus. Religious enthusiasm easily goes to seed. The human spirit so predominant dominates the show-off religious spirit, but we must stick to our text. Christ, he alone can save. The attention of the people must be first all and always held to him. A true Pentecost will produce a mighty conviction for sin. A turning to God. False manifestations produce only excitement and wonder. Sin and self life of 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 end up in fanaticism. Whatever causes us to exalt and love Jesus is well and safe. The reverse will ruin all. The Holy Ghost Hey! Got an incoming call. Can I just go ahead and turn this off? Alright. Hey, hey! Call Peak Rufin! That was a plant. I know you did that on purpose, Rich. You can't trick me. Got a free, got a free, I need a little bit of extra money in the basket there, brother. No, I'm just clowning. All right. Any work that exalts the Holy Ghost or the gifts above Jesus will finally land up in fanaticism. Whatever causes us to exalt and love Jesus is well and safe. The reverse will ruin all. The Holy Ghost is a great light, but focused on Jesus always for his revealing. Dude, is that not good? Dude, that's so pure, so good. That's what we need. Amen. We need another Pentecost. So look, this is what ended up happening. Look at that crowd, man. Look at them tents, bro. This is why I'm trying to show you some history. This is where you come from, Pentecost. This is what we believe. Hallelujah. Tent meetings, camp Camp meeting revivals. Look, man, these people, look, here's another one. Look at that little tent. But this is going on all over the nation. Big tents, small tents, people meeting in the woods. One of the things that I need you to understand, too, is, is that the Pentecostal believers early on were being ostracized. They were being buffooned by the Baptists, by the people that were very, like, like, they're outrageous. They're fanatics. They're out of control. So they were not well 
received. And so they didn't even have churches. They didn't have anything, but they'd go out into these crowds. They'd rent these tents. And like John Wesley taught them that. He would rent a field. What did he say? I rent a field. He'd put a tent up, sometimes a tent, sometimes not a tent, catch himself on fire, and they'd come to watch him burn. And the crowds would come. Amen. Look, out of this came the Assemblies of God, Church of God, four square. What do you think about denominations? I don't know what you think about denominations. I've already told you I don't think too much about them, but I will tell you this. Jimmy Swagger come out the Assemblies of God. Uh, David Wilkerson come out the Assemblies of God. So do what you want with it, but I'm just trying to make a point that at that time, this is who they had. They had each other, and they, and they, were com- they had common beliefs, and so they came together. You can look at it like disunity, but... But what it was is they were like, well, nobody else wants us. And so there were big groups of people, and they came together because they had common beliefs, and they believed that Jesus died on the cross for their sin. And they believed that they could be filled with the Holy Ghost. And they believed in the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And they believed in the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. And from this came these, this move of God. Amen? So, but look, I want to tell you something. With every move of God. Isn't that a, that's really a graphic, but I'm just saying, isn't that a beautiful river? I mean, you know, look, actually, Gabby may not know, she probably does know, but her grandfather was a preacher, in, a pastor in this area, and his name of his church was River Life. And, and that comes from the song, the old Pentecostal song uh, about a river, the river of life. The river is teeming with life, and everywhere it touches there, it brings life. That was the idea behind the name of that church, River Life. Because, and there was a song, and it's talking about the river. Because, see, the river and the rain is, and the fire is synonymous with the Holy Spirit. And where the river flows, it brings life. And where the rain falls, it causes harvest to come up. Amen? And, 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 but look, with every move of God, what happens? There's a counter move. Is there not? Okay, now listen, this is a warning, disclaimer, warning. You may not like what I'm about to say. I'm not doing it to be mean. I'm not doing it because I think I know everything. I'm doing it because I firmly believe in my heart that God has shown me some things that have happened in the past in the church. And listen, the end days are going to have similar things occurring. What are you talking about? Where every time there's a real move of God, there's going to be a counterfeit move of God. Just like Elijah called fire down from heaven, the Bible teaches in Revelation 13 that the Antichrist and the false prophet will be able to call fire down from heaven. This ain't no joke, my friend. It's going to be ugly. It's already ugly. Deceitfulness. The ain't Satan masquerading around like an angel of light, causing deceit in the hearts and lives of people. Much of the church world is deceived. Right now, as we speak, much of the church world is deceived. So with every move of God, there's a counter move. Look at that. Now, can you imagine this right here pouring into this river? Because, see, what I'm trying to show you is an example of something. What I'm about to talk to you about or what I'm about to let you witness through various videos is the fact that I believe that just as the Holy Spirit caused Azusa Street to take place and caused this Pentecostal movement to take place, that around the 1940s, pollution started to pour into the river. And I'm going to tell you what I call the pollution. It's got a river, it's a name, and it's a river, but it's dirty, and it's called the Word of Faith movement. Do what you want with that. I'm not here to pick on no particular person. I'm going to show you some pictures of some people. I'm going to show you some things, and listen... I thought about just letting it be a spiritual exercise and let you try to figure out on your own. But I'm just going to tell you what I think. And I don't, I, don't, I don't want you to believe what I'm telling you just because I believe it. I want you to just process it, take it in. And I want you to understand that my concern is this, that sometimes strange things start happening and it's not really the Lord. Now, I will tell you not that long ago, about three weeks, I shared it with you all. The Lord also revealed to me that I was overcritical, that I was overjudging, that I was trying to control so much that I was maybe possibly quenching the spirit. I don't want to do that either. I just want, and and let me just say this, because I'm going to, if you've ever heard of the Brownsville Revival, and I'm sure you already have opinions about that, because I had opinions about that, okay? 
I've been to Brownsville twice. I'm about to talk about that a little bit. Um, I'm going to show you some things on some video, and I'm going to let you make your own decision. But there's a lot of times that there's things that are taking place that we don't necessarily have the answers to. And what I, whenever we get into some of this, I want us to try to just view it, keep our, heart, keep our eyes open, keep our heart open to hear, what, to see what you think is going to happen. So the Word of Faith movement, I believe, was a pollution that was poured into a crystal clear river. Is everybody involved in the Word of Faith wrong? That's not what I'm saying. But let's just take another look at it a little bit. So look, the purest of rivers are in danger of pollution, right? Now, y'all do know that, right? It, would it surprise you? Let me ask you this. Let me put it to you this way. Many of you are, are seasoned Christians. Does it surprise you when I tell you that anytime God does a move, that the enemy has a counter move? Does that surprise you? No, you already know that. Come on, I didn't need to teach you that. You already believe that. All right, the work of the Christ will always be countered by the Antichrist. Look, I didn't tell you all this last week, but when John Wesley rode through America on horseback preaching the gospel and renting these fields and preaching and the crowds coming, it was within 70 years that both Mormonism and Jehovah Witnessism did the same thing. They got on horses and rode through the Old West spreading lies and false doctrine. Every single time God moves, the enemy is going to come in and begin to plant seeds of doubt and confusion. Now, in these videos that I'm about to show you, I'm asking you to do a couple of things. The first thing I want you to know is this. Let's look past the manifestations. Let's try to discern the spirits behind it. Okay? So how are you going to discern the spirits? You're going to imagine in your heart, what is the end result of this? And what was the teachings that came out of these movements, okay? What is being exalted? Is flesh being exalted or is Christ being exalted? Is repentance the result or is it just joy for me or whatever? You make your own decisions, but look, here we go. Here's the first one right here, all right? So you, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to enjoy it with you and let's just watch this video.
I don't, again, need anybody to agree with me or disagree with me. I do not believe that's God. I'm just going to tell you, I don't believe that's God. I believe that's flesh, all right? And I want you to read some of these scriptures yourself. Just go ahead and read it. They call that being drunk in the spirit, by the way. Sober. Let us be sober. So they call, and I was I was in the church during some of these time frames, whenever some of these things were going on, and some of you were also, and this is, that gentleman that we saw that was telling everybody to be blessed, his name is Kenneth Hagin. He is attributed to being the author of the Word of Faith movement. I didn't have time to show you all of the evidence of his plagiarism of a man named E.W. Kenyon. There's a lot that has been said about E.W. Kenyon that he actually was a, he delved into something called metaphysics which means uh, it's a type of spiritual move, but it's not a Holy Spirit move. It's connected to the occult. This is E.W. Kenyon's words on the left. Now, listen, there's, you can just Google it yourself, and you will see the multiple places where Hagen plagiarized him word for word. Okay, um, but let's just look at this one because this gives you an idea of the teaching of the Word of Faith movement. Whether you realize they teach this or not is not really what's important. I've seen it on Kenneth Copeland's website before he took it down. I've, I've seen it in Joyce Meyer's book. It's there. It's documented. They're not going to always tell you what it is that they're believing. I'm telling you, I've seen it with my own eyes. Okay, this is E.W. Kenyon's side here. I'll go back and forth. E.W. Kenyon, the 22nd Psalm gives a graphic picture of the crucifixion of Jesus. Kenneth Hagin, the 22nd Psalm gives a graphic picture of the crucifixion of Jesus more vivid than that of John, Matthew, or Mark witnessed it. It is more, E.W. Kenyon, it is more vivid than that of John, Matthew, or Mark who witnessed it. Uh, E.W. Kenyon still, but he says the strangest words. Kenneth Hagin, he utters the strange words. E.W. Kenyon, but thou art holy. Kenneth Hagin, but thou art holy. E.W. Kenyon, what does that mean? Kenneth Hagin, what does that mean? This is the line right here. He is becoming sin. E.W. Kenyon, Kenneth Hagin, he is becoming sin. The, at the foundation of the Word of Faith movement, they teach that Jesus became a sinner on the cross. I've heard Co Kenneth Copeland say it. I read it on his website. He said he had to have become a sinner on the cross because he had to die spiritually in your place. And then they teach. You won't see them saying it a lot on television, but they say, and Jesus descended into the lower parts of hell. We don't have time to break down what all that means. And as the first born again from the dead believer, he spoke forth the positive confession, the words of your mouth. He spoke forth and he, he spoke his born again status into existence. There is nothing in the word of God that tells you that Jesus went down to the torture side of hell. That first of all, the devil ain't in hell. The devil's roaming around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There's nothing in the scripture that says de Jesus went down to hell and had a fight with the devil and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from the devil. There's nothing that teaches anything like that yet, but many people believe that to be true. So look, this, I wanted you to see, is I do not believe that this is a true move of God. I, and, I, and, and the point that I want you to, to also see with these manifestations that took place is, was this really giving glory to the Lord? And you make that decision on your own. You don't need me to help you with that. Now, I want to share with you a little bit of this. 
When I went, I went to the Brownsville Revival two different times. And listen, Robert knows. I've talked to Robert about Brownsville, and I had a bad taste in my mouth about Brownsville. Let me tell you why, though. It was the second time that I went after the Lord got a hold of me. I got up to go to the bathroom. Now, listen, when I'm talking to you about crowds of people, we waited outside for three hours to get into this place. This, how, how many days a week were they having service? Was it every day? Do you remember how many years it went on for? Five years. Every day for five years, crowds of hundreds, if not thousands of people showing up because they wanted to move of God. In Brownsville, Florida, which is right near Pensacola. I waited in line two different times. Sierra was a baby both times. The second time that we went was after the Lord had gotten a hold of me and I was starting to understand things of God. I got up to go to the bathroom and on the fringes outside of the service, there was a guy that looked like he was drunk and he was dancing around and him and another guy and he was going around laying hands on people and I felt the weirdest thing in my spirit and I just told him no, I didn't want him to lay his hands on me. Based upon that, I made a negative assumption. Then I would see people also doing something that we call manifestations. They were doing all kind of different movements and things like that. And I took that negatively also. All right. But but then, but but one of the things that I want to say about that is this. One of the times I was there, the pastor got up and he said, pray with us, saints. Pray with us, saints, because look, there's witches up in that balcony right now. There, we know that there's witches in that balcony right now, and they are, they are coming against, and they are praying against God's movement. So what I'm trying to say is, is that when a true move of God starts to happen like that, the enemy is going to try to come in. So the question is, it was the things that we saw all bad because it wasn't truly God, or was there an intermixing of, and see, if you and I ain't never had a move of God like that happen, it's easy for us to stand backwards and to say that it wasn't the Lord. So in this particular video, I want, I'm going to let you watch this video. This is a young lady, so there's other videos of her as she got older, because this was the altar call song every single service that they had during here, and this song is so beautiful, dude. It's called Come Run Into the Mercy Seat. Come running, come running to the mercy seat where Jesus is waiting. His blood, how does it go? His grace will cover thee. His blood will flow freely. It will provide the healing. Come running, I'm running to the mercy seat. Now listen, the preacher that you're going to see, the first guy on the stage that's making the altar call is that same evangelist that I've told you all about multiple times that was a heroin addict. That was sitting in his bed and throwing the syringes up in the ceiling. Steve Hill. Okay. And I, the two times I saw him preach, he preached the cross as he knew it. He wasn't preaching the cross for sanctification. He was telling people to get right with the Lord. He was calling for people to be saved. Look, it was there that I told y'all the story on Friday nights. They'd have a baptismal service. And on Friday nights, that, that woman, when after she went in the water, she said, I don't want Buddha. I want my Jesus. I love my Jesus. Jesus. And so I want you to see this, and, uh, and, then, and then we'll just kind of just watch this together. So this is an altar call at Brownsville. I need the Lord.
Forgive me, Lord. They're about to show you the pastor. Watch what he's doing. Look at him, weeping in his handkerchief. Can't do anything but weep. Praise God. So, to me... The first thing that I notice in the difference is, is the call to repentance. He's like, come, friends. Come, friends. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Lord, please forgive me. And you see the pastor. I mean, look, the pastor is just sitting there, and all he can do is weep in the handkerchief because the presence of God is overwhelming him. Now, I thought that this little testimony right here, dude, I'm telling you, I played it for Danielle a couple of times already. I played it again yesterday, and I just, I, I, I'm all choked up, dude, every time I watch it now. She's making some strange movements, and I'm going to try to, she explains it at the end, and then I'm going to try to explain it with some scripture afterwards, um, but because people started to do some different kind of movements, the pastor felt like it was important to explain things to people, and he used this young lady right here to explain what was going on, and her name's Allison Ward, so let's just listen to her testimony right here. It was really powerful, at least it was for me. Uh, when you see someone like this and you just make a snap judgment and you see someone doing something like this you may say oh 
I don't know if you felt what I just felt when she said that about the time is short. There's not much time. That's the presence of the Lord right there, buddy. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, I see it. I'm hundred years old. 
ਕੀ ਕਰਾਂ ਹੁਣ ਕੀ ਕਰਾਂ ਕੀ ਹਾਲ ਉਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਬਰੇਰ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਜੀ Holy Spirit, we just ask that you minister. Minister to our hearts and to our lives. We believe that the time is short, but God, move by your Spirit. Move by your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Do a work in our hearts and in our lives, Lord. Cause our hearts to grieve, O oh Lord God. Lord, cause our hearts to grieve for lost souls, O oh Lord. Cause us, O oh Lord God, to feel it in our pres- in our spirit, O oh Lord God. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and finish, and we're going to pray before we go. Um, Ezra, out of Ezra, it says, Then were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away and I sat a stone eve until the evening sacrifice. The word of God says he trembled under the presence of God. The word of God said that he sat a stone eve. He was, conf- he, he was just overwhelmed. And so we see biblical precedents for this. Now, one of the things that I kind of wanted to end with was this is the gentleman that we talked about earlier. This guy here, you may be familiar with him. His name is Robert Schuler. He was in charge of the Crystal Cathedral. Uh, There's a book written called Deceived on Purpose, and the guy was a New Ager. And when he saw the teachings of this man after he got saved, he was like, I cannot understand how the church world can buy into this. This right here, you might be familiar with him. This is Mr. Kenneth Copeland. I told you some of the things about him. There's a video circulating around right now where he pretends to cut his hand and drop blood into a cup. And some people say that they actually saw blood drip. I didn't see the blood drip, but that they drank this cup together. And in the middle of all of this, I want you to see this gentleman right here. This is Mr. Jimmy Swaggart right here. The reason that I want to point this out to you is, is because, and I do a background uh, information on Brother Swaggart, and what I realize is this, is that at the time, before all of that stuff happened in Jimmy Swaggart's life, you got to understand, Jimmy Swaggart was the first preacher to ever speak in tongues on national television. He told Ken, see, he was, the reason I put him in the middle of all this is because he was best friends with Kenneth Copeland. He was also extremely close friends with Robert Schuler. And he was friends with Kenneth Hagin. And he was the first preacher on television when he told Kenneth Copeland that he was going to speak in tongues because the Lord told him to pray in tongues on ta- national television. Kenneth Copeland told him, no, you can't do that. He said, oh, no, I will because the Lord told me to do it. Today on the radio, they announced that he is the longest lasting televangelist that's ever existed. In the midst of all of that, I want you to see that he was in the middle of all of this. You understand what I'm saying? Am I trying to say that the things of the past that happened were God's will? No, but he causes all things to work together for good to those that love the Lord. And I believe that in the midst of all of that, the brokenness, one thing that I know that came out of that is this. Let me ask you a question. When's the first time you ever saw someone teach Romans chapter 6 of a Pentecostal persuasion on national TV? I can answer that for you. His name is Jimmy Swaggart. When's the last time you saw a Pentecostal preacher 
expositorily preach Romans chapter 6 on national television. I can answer that question for you. His name is Jimmy Swaggart. In the midst of all, I'm not here to lift up a man. I'm really not. I'm here to try to make a point. As I watch the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit through the ages, I'm beginning to see something happening. I'm beginning to see that when God moves, it's about the Word of God and that the Spirit of God wants to move. I'm here to tell you that I believe firmly with all of my heart that God purposefully positioned this man, the situation with the message of the cross, for an end-time move of God, and he's bringing people back to the Word of God. He had to get him out of all of this. Again, that's all I'm saying. He had to get him out of this. Praise God. Now, with that said, I'm about to close. All right. We need another Pentecost. Send the fire, Lord. And when he's going to send the fire, it's going to be the word of God along with the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Let it rain. Amen. Let it rain. Let the glory come down. Father.